Lake Ackerman is a shallow saltwater lake located in South Australia. In this arid area of Australia's outback, this seemingly innocuous structure has existed here for around 580 million years, after a massive meteorite suddenly smashed into this part of the world, creating untold devastation in the process. Massive tsunamis were created from this impact event, and the fallout from it would cause far-reaching consequences that would alter Earth for decades to come. Today, we're going to introduce a new tool to this channel so that we can take a better look at Lake Ackerman and the impact event that created it. Alongside this, as per usual, we'll also take a look at the magnetics to better define this structure. And I believe there may exist one or two large volcanic calderas of a completely unrelated origin existing right alongside Lake Ackerman, which I'll also segue into briefly as the video progresses. Present day Lake Ackerman is hard to read. It's been significantly eroded and is different in terms of how it looks compared to other more circular meteorite craters that exist in Australia and around the world, such as this infamous meteorite crater in Wolf Creek. But make no mistake, this area is without a doubt a massive impact site. In fact, it's actually one of the largest that's been found anywhere on the world. The rock that this meteorite smashed into was primarily lava created by a supervolcanic eruption that took place here 1.6 billion years ago. And it threw this rock very far from the site of impact, with it being launched well over 500 kilometers away during the event. The original crater is 90 kilometers wide, and the velocity that this meteorite struck the Earth at was around 25 kilometers per second. The tsunamis generated by this event would have been unbelievably massive, at least 500 meters in height, with it more likely being closer to one kilometer in height. When we examine the rock found directly within the crater, we see the telltale signs of a massive meteorite impact. The two qualities I'm about to discuss aren't found naturally anywhere else on our planet. They are entirely extraterrestrial in their origin and their presentation. The pressures required to form both of them do not occur on the surface of the Earth and aren't able to be explained by other mechanisms. The first is shatter cones, a very distinct conical feature found in these rocks. The second is shocked quartz grains. These very fine planar fractures are created in tiny quartz grains after they have been subjected to immense pressures. When we fly over Lake Ackerman, we see the outcropping of the ancient Gawler Ranges volcanic rock, amongst much more recent lake deposits. As previously mentioned, this impact crater isn't the simple bowl shape often seen and associated with meteorite impact craters. And as a result of this, it's known as a complex crater, because it has a complicated surface with variations in elevations. The reason for this is because over time, the surface has eroded several kilometers below the original crater floor, exposing the more erosion resistant rocks in the process. When we look at Lake Ackerman under the magnetics, we have a further telltale sign of an epic asteroid impact. The center of it is protruding, and I'll explain the reason for this shortly. Life did exist at this point in time in the form of acrotarchs, which are small organic microfossils known to exist in the fossil record starting around 1.8 billion years ago and existing all the way to present day. And when this event occurred, a dramatic change in a type of these acrotarchs was found in the rock record from this time, which coincides with the estimated occurrence of the Ackerman impact, showing just how far reaching the effects of this event might have been. So what actually happened when this meteorite struck Earth? Well, as the asteroid made impact with the shallow Adelaidean Ocean that existed here 580 million years ago, a blinding light would have flashed forth as the muddy ocean bedrock succumbs to an unimaginable level of heat and energy. It's literally vaporized instantly upon contact when this gigantic extraterrestrial rock makes impact. The meteorite penetrates through kilometers worth of sedimentary material, ushering forth a level of destructivity that stretches far beyond any weapon that humans have ever created. An ever-expanding shockwave is seen as a white sphere that stretches forth in all directions. This shockwave produces massive tsunamis, and the thermal radiation emanating from it 
travels forth at the speed of light, sterilizing everything in a massive radius around it. The energy of the impact dives into the Earth's crust like a stone being thrown into a pond. The solid bedrock in the immediate impact site loses the ability to be solid, as the meteorite vaporizes it upon contact. This bedrock is melted into a hot plasma, as a 90 km wide crater is created. Just for reference, the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs created a 100 km wide crater, so this event is just short of that kind of massive event. The shallow Adelaidean Ocean is thrust back in all directions for hundreds of kilometers, and the liquid consistency of the Earth's crust begins to solidify again and bounce back in a rebounded state, forming this protruding mountain that we can see on magnetics today. Material is blasted from this once peaceful shallow ocean out into space, where much of it then falls back to the Earth as superheated debris, which comes crashing down back into the Earth at incredible speeds. Some of this material will orbit the Earth for thousands of years before it crashes back down though, so not all of it immediately fell back down to the Earth, and some of it may have even reached as far as Mars. But in general, most of it came straight back down, and this is where things took a turn for the worst, which was something you probably thought was impossible at this stage. But it isn't. Because as material falls back to the Earth, it reaches extremely hot temperatures. This material heats up the atmosphere, creating a heat shock, scorching the entire Earth. No trees existed at this time, so no real wildfires were created. But this event would have been felt everywhere on Earth. Earthquakes of a tremendous magnitude 11 would have been produced, and it's possible that this impact event caused immense volcanism on the opposite side of the planet from where the impact site occurred, most likely in the form of flood basalts. It also more than likely caused many volcanoes to erupt, as the shockwaves and earthquakes would have created faults, fractures or conduits, allowing magma to rapidly ascend, or it might have just raised the pressure levels inside the magma chamber itself, creating a catalyst for violent explosive eruptions to occur. And this would have been both near and far from where the meteorite struck, as the shockwaves travelled in all directions. Much like a volcanic or nuclear winter, a gigantic ash cloud formed by the vaporised material spreads forth in all directions, eventually shrouding the entire planet in a blanket of solar reflecting aerosols, possibly plunging the entire planet into a deep freeze and ushering forth an era of glaciation. This is where the Akrotarks got hit hard. This shrouding of the Earth temporarily halted photosynthesis, leading to a mass die-off of plankton that the entire ocean ecosystem relied on to survive. This is most likely why there was a significant variance in these organisms pre and post impact. When this meteorite made contact with the Earth, the ejecta that it threw up into the surrounding area eventually settled into the mud on the surrounding sea floor. This ejecta is associated with an iridium anomaly, suggesting it had been contaminated with extraterrestrial material, aka the meteorite. Nowadays, this 20 km diameter lake is a shadow of its former glory. Over 2.5 km of the original crater floor has been eroded. We can find the ejecta associated with this event in many places far away from the impact crater. At Bunyaroo Gorge, we have one example of this in the rock layer known as the Bunyaroo Formation. This is a sedimentary layer of shale, which is a grey coloured deep water sedimentary rock formed in a marine environment. In these rocks, we see a very sharp break, and distinctive alien rock fragments appear in the rock record which should not be here. These are from the Gawler Range Volcanics, which were released far away from this location one billion years before the meteorite struck. They are pieces of volcanic rock from Ayers Peninsula, which have been tied in with this sedimentary shale as a result of it landing here after being launched far away from the original impact site. The Gawler Range's Volcanics is a very distinct and beautiful pink rhyolite that cannot come from this area. There is no logical source and it's chemically identical to the Gawler's Range's Volcanics, which travelled 300 kilometres to reach this site. It's safe to say that geologically speaking, this was an extreme event. So that's the story of the Lake Ackerman Impact Crater, one of the largest meteorite craters to exist on our planet. When we fly low and over the middle of it, a quick 360 degree rotation 
clearly shows the outline of this massive impact crater, with it ending where the mountains begin. It was a truly extreme event that had immense implications for evolution and for the Earth at large. One day, another Ackerman-sized meteorite is going to travel our way, and these events will repeat themselves once more on this planet. Let's just hope that we're prepared before that happens. Thanks for watching. Don't worry, I won't leave you hanging. I know I mentioned I might have spotted two calderas. I suspect that these might be associated with the Yardia Dacite, and if not, then it might be one of the spots where the strange and very unique Gaulas Ranges Volcanics was released, which I'll be making a video on real soon. There's a structure that looks to be a pretty visible ring dike here, and another that's only really visible on magnetics. I'm not sure if they're calderas or intrusives, but I'd say they're worth looking into further, and I definitely intend to do that one day when I go there in person. I hope you enjoyed this meteorite topic though. I've been reading your comments and yep, I'll begin making videos that covers events that occurred in other states in Australia other than Victoria, and I'll be beginning a New South Wales series shortly. Thank you all for leaving your comments, it's been a chaotic few weeks for me as I deal with some personal stuff, but I'm trying to reply to as many comments as I can. My work hours are a little insane and it's become a little difficult with the hundreds of comments and emails that I'm receiving daily, but I will try to get back to as many of you as I can as soon as possible. Big things are due to happen in the near future, as this channel continues to grow. If you found this video interesting or fascinating, then you're probably a little into earth science or science in general. I release new videos once a week, so consider subscribing and if you'd like to help the channel out, the best way that you can contribute and make a huge difference is by sharing our videos around first and foremost, followed by liking the video to let YouTube know we're doing something right. Thanks again for supporting the channel, it really does mean the world to me, and like always, I'll see you all real soon.